Hi, I'm Dr. Younger. I'm director of the Neuroinflammation Pain and Fatigue Lab. So we neuroscientists know that chronic inflammation causes depression, but not everyone else knows that. So I want to show you why depression is a symptom of chronic inflammation, where in the brain that happens, and how we know that's the case. Because I think it's really important if you're dealing with a chronic condition that involves inflammation. So if you've had, or if you have fibromyalgia or ME-CFS or Gulf 4 illness or related disorders, and you're dealing with chronic pain or chronic fatigue or chronic cognitive issues, you may have heard someone say, and maybe even a clinician say, I think you're just depressed. And when you got that response from someone that can put you in a very bewildered, confusing state, it may put you in an infuriating position of having to explain, well, yeah, I have depressed mood. I feel depressed, but that's because of this chronic condition. It's because of all these things that have been taken away from me. And you've had to explain that the pain and fatigue and cognitive issues, they're not just a symptom of depression. They're, they're probably in your mind, the cause of the depression. And what angers me about these discussions is that we've known for decades that depression and depressed mood is an expected consequence of systemic chronic inflammation. We know why it exists. We know the chemicals involved, the neurochemicals involved. We know the brain pathways involved. We know how to image it. We can actually see it. We can see the regions. We even know how to create it in the laboratory if we want, in any mammalian species, including humans. So we use a chemical called lipipolysaccharide. You may have heard me talk about this before. It's one of the chemicals I use in my research. You can inject that into rodents and cause inflammation-induced depressed mood. That's something I don't do. You can inject it in primates and in, in monkeys. Do the same thing. That's something I don't do. And you can inject it in even healthy people and cause temporary uh, inflammation-induced depressed mood. And that's something I do to understand how we're going to cure these issues. So all mammals show inflammation-induced depressed mood. There's nothing. We've known about this for such a long time. There's really no mystery. Now, what this is called is cytokine-induced sickness response. It's going to cause, and it's a normal response to inflammation in your body. It's going to cause malaise. So you're going to feel just bad all over physically, mentally. Everything just feels bad. You're going to be fatigued. So you just, you lack the energy to do anything. You'll have antidonia. So things that are typically pleasurable to you are no longer as pleasurable. You'll have social isolation, so you won't want to be around people. Maybe you won't want to be around anyone. You'll have decreased motivation for pretty much anything. Everything is just hard. And so the bottom line is everything you want to do just has such a tremendous weight of effort on top of it. And that is a normal response to inflammation. And also feelings like hopelessness and guilt and shame, those are actually products of inflammation that we can to recreate in the laboratory as well. Now, the reason why our brain makes us feel so bad when we have inflammation is it's to keep society safe from infectious illnesses. It keeps you away from people and it keeps you from doing things when you need to rest and let your immune system fight off this infection. And so it's very beneficial in the short term, but with chronic non-communicable diseases like rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or multiple sclerosis or myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome or fibromyalgia or mast cell activation syndrome. These things can't be spread from person to person. And so having your central nervous system basically forcing you to stay in your room or your house and not do anything all the time, it's no longer helpful. You're not protecting anyone and you're not protecting yourself at that point. And so the depressed mood, which can be helpful in some circumstances, 
is no longer helpful. It's making the problem much, much worse. And that's something that we have to deal with. So let me show you where this happens. So here's a brain. This may or may not be me. It's a side view of a brain. This is kind of the mid. It's like you slice the brain kind of right in the middle from the side view. I'm going to put an arrow here that shows you the direction it's facing. And this green cross is just a centering point that I use for lining up the scan. The, the, the cross has nothing to do with what we're talking about. So let me show you uh, the region that's important. Now in blue, I've marked what we call the cingulate cortex. And it's a little bit bigger than what I show here. This is, it's a little fatter, the line. So this just shows you where the cingulate cortex basically is. And it wraps around the corpus callosum. Now it's divided up into three major parts. In the back in blue is the posterior cingulate. Then in the green, you have the mid cingulate. And then in the red, you have the anterior cingulate. And it's really that anterior cingulate where we look at in terms of fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome, what's causing the pain, what's causing the uh, depression and anxiety. We typically focus on that red anterior cingulate. But this region is even more important to inflammation-induced depression. It's this little yellow circle I have, and this is called the subgenual ACC. This is the key region, so SGACC. Now, this is the region where inflammatory cytokines, and the main ones are interleukin-1 beta and tumor necrosis factor alpha, act to alter the activity and the connection between the subgenual ACC with other brain regions with the net effect of removing pleasurable feelings and depressed moods. So when you have an inflammatory state in the brain and the microglia cells are releasing these cytokines, the action at the subgenual ACC is to cause the depressed mood. This is the primary site. Now, just as an example of this, I'm going to show you an older paper. I just want to make it clear that we've really known about this for quite a while. This is an fMRI study from 2009, which means the work was done probably 2007, 2008. So we're talking about like 15 years ago. And it's inflammation causes mood changes through alterations in subgenual cingulate activity. And this is the region. So we're looking to the right again, and you can see that the hottest activation is that white spot, which is exactly in the subgenual ACC. And they injected a chemical like what I talked about. They used, it wasn't lipopolysaccharide, they used something else, but they activated the immune system in healthy individuals. They caused inflammation and they caused this depressed mood on a, in a temporary basis. And this is the region where the changed activity was predicting that inflammation induced mood decrease. So, really, this has been known so well for such a long time that this is the site where the most powerful depression treatment is used. And you might have heard about this. It's deep brain stimulation. When every other treatment has failed, where if you've tried psychotherapy, you've tried all the medications, you've tried electroconvulsive shock therapy, and nothing has worked, the last resort is deep brain stimulation. And that's where you will cut holes in the skull, you'll put leads down into the brain, you'll feed them into the subgenual ACC. There's actually a left SAGCC and a right sub SGACC. So you have to feed separate leads into the left and right, and then you can turn them on and it can have an instantaneous effect of alleviating the depression. Now you might've seen videos of this done for depression or for other um, issues like Parkinson's mo movement disorders but we'll just focus on depression. So you put the leads in and then the surgeons will activate the leads and they can ask the patient when they hit the right spot by asking, okay, rate your happiness from zero to 10. And so they'll ask this and they'll say, okay, rate your happiness. And the person will say, zero, I'm always depressed, zero. And they'll say, what about now? Zero. Then they'll adjust a little bit. And then suddenly the patient will say, oh, I feel happy. It's a seven, it's an eight, it's a nine, it's a 10. I feel like this huge weight has been lifted. Sometimes they'll start laughing. The effects are so amazing and, and they're so immediate. This 
neuromodulatory, this deep brain stimulation ap approach to dealing with depression can lead to, I would say, a complete remission, like the depression is gone. I, I hesitate to call it complete remission because you have to keep this, the leads in. So you may wear those for years or maybe for the rest of your life, but it can completely remove the depression. And it works in a lot of people, a high percentage of people, if they find the right spot, use the right um, pulse pulses and the frequency, and they get it right, which I think in most cases they do, you can have an incredible remission of the depression. Now, this is still experimental. You can't just walk into any hospital clinic and ask for this to be done. And the reason is, is it's what you might think. This is a risky paradigm. It's a risky intervention because you're cutting holes in the skull and you're taking things and putting them into the brain. And then once the person leaves and goes about their daily life, they're walking around with things that are half inside their brain and half outside their brain. And you always have to worry about risk of infection, especially when it's first being um, planted, when the leads are being inserted. So incredible tool. Um, there's advances occurring every year. So very, very exciting. And we, it definitely shows us that we're on the right track. We know the regions and we know what needs to be done. And our best tool right now is the deep brain stimulation. But we need to find other ways to accomplish the same thing. How can we have the same effect without having to through the skull? And that's the kind of thing that I'm looking at as a neuroscientist interested in reducing neuroinflammation. I'll talk about some of the other attempts that are being developed in um, some different videos. So really the bottom line is depressed mood is expected with systemic inflammation. It's not anything that you're doing wrong. Your depression to the extent that you have it may be due completely to systemic inflammatory activity. Now, not all depression is inflammatory. There are some people that are depressed for completely different reasons. But if you have things like fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome and the long lists of conditions I study, and you have depressed mood, there's a considerable chance that that depression is being caused by the systemic inflammation that you're dealing with. Now, I'm not a psychiatrist and I'm not a clinical psychologist, so I don't give advice on any psychological treatments. Um, tackling the depression, if that's one of the symptoms you're dealing with, may help. Uh, taking medications can help. In some cases it will, and in some cases it won't. But where I come into it is, I believe if we can remove the underlying inflammation in the brain, that will make the depressed mood go away automatically. And so that's the angle that I'm working on. So uh, again, the main message is we know quite a bit about this. We know where, we know what to do, and we know how to get to it. We know where it is. It's just we're trying to, we're struggling with the practicalities of how do you do it safely and how do you do it efficiently without causing any other issues? How do you get to the target without disturbing anything else? And, and again, because of the location, it's so deep, it's pretty tricky. So again, I'll talk more about other neuromodulatory techniques uh, pretty soon. Uh, in the meantime, I'm, I'm going to link a video that I made a few weeks ago about the NST uh, the nucleus of the solitary, solitary track that may be sending these aberrant messages to the subgenual ACC and what brain region is actually causing the subgenual ACC to act this way to begin with. So you may want to check that out if you haven't. But um, stay tuned on this channel. I've got a lot more to uh, talk about and I will see you next week.